thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers for this wonderful event. I am very excited about the 10th World Fintech Forum, so I, I want to look ahead. But uh, in order to get there, first we have to understand risks associated with fintech because if we don't understand risks associated with fintech we will never get to the 10th world fintech forum uh, now i will talk about uh, risks associated with two specific areas within fintech one is crowdfunding and the other is peer-to-peer -peer lending so the model i have created uh, for this purpose is the komodo dragon model do you know the komodo dragon it's a huge lizard. It lives in Indonesia and it can grow to three meters long. Okay? It eats meat and sometimes it even attacks people because it's three meters long. Okay? Here it's eating a goat. That is the Komodo dragon. So, let's see the model first. Uh, there is the expression of peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding. And there is a third expression circulating in the expert community, and that is marketplace lending. Now, some people use marketplace lending as the synonym of peer-to-peer -peer lending. But in fact, it makes more sense to use marketplace lending uh, for peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending and crowdfunding. And you can see the difference between peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding. Peer-to-peer -peer lending is debt transaction, obviously. Crowdfunding is usually equity transaction. You know the history of crowdfunding. It started with something else than equity, but right now it's an equity transaction. And peer-to-peer -peer lending is done by uh, private people to private people, while crowdfunding is uh, usually done between uh, private people and uh, micro, small, and mid-sized enterprises. Of course, it's changing because there are more and more institutional players in both peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding, and actually that's one of the risks. But let's go through the 12 risks, the 12 key risks. So, first, for K, the knowledge gap about risks by average consumers. So basically, one would think that uh, um, People who do crowdfunding, who put their money into crowdfunding projects or who uh, uh, participate in peer-to-peer -peer lending are absolutely clearly aware of the risks. They know that they can lose their money and they can lose their money very easily. Now, uh, as it turns out from uh, specific uh, cases, average people, even people who participate in crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending, are usually not aware of the risks. It's unbelievable, but it's true. Uh, a major crowdfunding project failed in Europe, and basically investors uh, 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 were absolutely outraged and surprised, and they didn't understand the situation, and they were trying to turn to some authorities. And uh, they tried to uh, turn to media, and, and, and they complained. And uh, so, so, so just like in case of Ponzi schemes or miraculous investments, you know, like 30% return annually without risk, or, or we all hear about these miraculous investments based on Bitcoin, which promise you to double your money within a year. So there is always something uh, uh, which is based on lies, like 10 years ago it was real estate, now it's Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the mind-boggling thing is that average people don't learn it, that they can lose their money very easily. And this is a risk in itself. Think, think it through. Okay, uh, for O, overregulation reflex hits the sector. So basically, right now banks are overregulated, fintech activity is underregulated. We will talk more about this, but this is the bottom line. What if 
peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding starts to be regulated just like normal banking activity. Most of the sites couldn't match uh, those requirements, those compliance requirements, that very heavy uh, 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 amount of regulation. And that is a risk in itself because, for example, loans uh, and funding cannot be renewed, cannot be extended. Uh, so, so that is a serious risk. For M, misleading NPL rates. You can see on the left the NPL rates in the Italian banking system. Now, the Italian banking system is sort of proxy for the European banking system because Italy is not as well to do in terms of financial system as Germany, but not as bad as Greece, so it's somewhere in the middle. And the very sad thing is that their NPL rates, average NPL rates, are around 17%. And it's amazingly negative that it's growing, uh, 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 it's growing year by year uh, since 2008. So basically, unlike U.S. banks, and this is a big lesson. This is not about crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending. This is a general lesson. Unlike U.S. banks, which got rid of most of the bad debt from their balance sheet because they read the textbooks how to get out of this situation, European banks are slower much, much slower. But anyway, so 17% NPL in Italian banking system. Do you know the NPL rates, peer-to-peer -peer lending sites and crowdfunding sites are reporting? Those are between 0.5 and 5%, usually around 2% NPL, okay? Do you think it's relevant? Do you think it's representative? Do you think it can be maintained? The answer is obviously no. So NPL rates will have to grow in these sectors. And the reason why the reported NPL rates are so low is not fraud, they are not lying. The reason is that their portfolio is young. You see, people didn't have time to fail and there is almost full renewal. If my loan is always renewed, and sometimes even extended, or if my funding, speaking about equity, uh, is, is always extended, I cannot basically fail. And crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending are in this stage. But it cannot go on forever. Okay, for second though. Omnipotent wealth management solution. So basically, uh, uh, I have read some internal materials of some major wealth management companies. And when I started to read those materials, uh, I was already aware that wealth management companies are thinking about securitizing crowdfunding, securitizing peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, and offering these securities as a great new asset class to their clients. And I thought that, okay, okay, of course we hear these rumors, but, but those bankers, I mean, they remember 2008 so clearly. It cannot happen. And then I read these internal materials, and, 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 and people are just so excited, like we have found the new asset class, it will be great, and default rates are very low, we have to provide it to our clients, how can we issue uh, 200 million within two months, which sites to cooperate with, uh, how to securitize it, uh, how much we can sell. So basically, uh, wealth management companies are, are very excited about this, and uh, I think that they, they, they don't want to see the risk, or, or, or some of them don't want to see the risks. And uh, uh, remember, it's very much like uh, 2008. Of course, it's much smaller. You see the total amount. Okay, by the way, how big it is? So, <clears throat> to marketplace lending so far globally, uh, the amount of money that has uh, flown in and out for funding is around 50 billion US dollars and it's on, a, uh, on an exponential uh, growth uh, basically, it has doubled in the last uh, two, three, four years. So this is absolutely exponential. And obviously, the prediction is that this exponential stage cannot go on forever. So basically, it will, it will uh, decline to a linear 
path, you see. Uh, but uh, by the way, compared to these 50, 50 billion US dollars, the uh, total assets of the total global banking system is 150 trillion US dollars. By the way, total annual global GDP is 75 uh, trillion US dollars. So it's like 200% uh, uh, total assets of the global banking system compared to the total global annual dollar denominated GDP and uh, basically uh, so 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 it's 3000 times larger balance sheet which banks have than which the total of all peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding companies have. It's very exciting. So while uh, $1 is issued in peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding, $2,999 are uh, issued by banks uh, if we look at uh, it in a stock way. Anyway, D, dream scoring. I talk to peer-to-peer -peer lenders, crowdfunders, and they all tell me about the magic formula. And you know what? Before 2008, I have heard about this magic formu formula so much. You see, like real estate prices will go up forever because there are more people on the uh, globe and the uh, blah, 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 and, and we have the formula and it works and it's so great. Now, the magic formula nowadays is often called social media credit scoring. Social media credit scoring, I think, is a great thing. But it's not magic. It's like good to be scored in the old way, the traditional way, and it's some additional information to be scored uh, by your social media activities. Social media credit scoring, the global market leader is Friendly Score, by the way, an absolutely great company, but there are uh, dozens of competitors of Friendly Score, and the idea about social media credit scoring is that you allow Friendly Score or another company to pull the information from your social media activity, from your Facebook site, from your LinkedIn, and even from your browser history. And based on that information, they come up with a score. And many peer-to-peer -peer lending sites and um, crowdfunding sites use that. Usually peer-to-peer -peer lending is using that because it belongs there. But, but it's not a dream formula. It's something additional, something marginal, but, but uh, it's not the solution. Okay, uh, oh, origination is not everything. Lack of workout and lack of monitoring. I mean, think about this. Banks have workout departments. Banks have dozens of years of experience with the workout process. Uh, legal background, legal experts, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's still very, very hard to do workout, to get money from someone who doesn't want pay. Okay? Now, uh, these sites don't have workout processes. And if I go into crowdfunding, can, can I do workout myself? Uh, <laughs> that would be even illegal. Okay? Uh, 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 so this is a big problem. Then, D, destabilizing the risk equilibrium, the hamster wheel effect. So basically, Platforms, platforms, peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding platforms. How, what's their business model? How do they make money? They only can make, basically only can make money on new transactions. So it's in their best interest and it's a must, it's a pressure uh, 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 to, to get more and more and more new transactions. So these platforms are not neutral not neutral in terms of the quality of transactions, but there is a negative bias. There is a bias towards getting the standards lower and lower and lower. It's a risk coded into the process and it's a hamster wheel. You have to get new deals in order to stay alive. Okay? Now, R for rate hike risk and foreign exchange rate risk. If you earn money in denominated in Korean ones and most of your expenses are also denominated in Korean ones and you fund something in US dollars or Swiss franc or blah, blah, blah. That is an FX rate risk. Like US uh, Treasury Secretary Jack Lew was just here yesterday, and uh, maybe he was talking about the Korean one being a little bit too weak. 
Okay, I don't know, but you know, if you find something uh, uh, in U.S. dollars, and this guy comes here and tells you to raise the value of your money, uh, uh, and it happens, then it's a problem because you get back your money in a relatively, uh, uh, you know, like you get less uh, Korean ones. Uh, but there are many other examples. Foreign exchange rate risk is always underestimated by non-professional investors. Even professional investors uh, struggle a lot with it. F rate hike, I mean, think about this. How will crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending deals be extended and renewed if people, if in the future, if in the future, after a serious agile rate hike cycle, which can happen. People think it will never happen, like new normal, rates will stay zero forever. No. Historic average uh, 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 US rates are around three and a half uh, percent, three and a half, four percent. Rates will go back. People will put their money into the bank or treasuries. Uh, uh, you know, why, why to do something so risky? So rate hike risk, foreign exchange rate risk. Uh, then, uh, A, AML, KYC, uh, CFT issues. Um, basically, um, you know, these sites are not regulated as tightly as banks. We have talked about this. This is an advantage that they don't have the same compliance uh, uh, requirements behind them, but it's also a risk. Not such a huge risk, but still, every transaction carries some risk like this. Uh, now, G. Growing fintech through fintech. One of the, if you go on a crowdfunding site, one of the mind-boggling things is that you see many other fintech activities trying to fund themselves through that crowdfunding site. It's beautiful. It's like crowdfunding squared or fintech squared. You see? It's beautiful. However, it's risk squared. Okay, uh, 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 what if this funding channel fails? Then it's not only the site failing, it's on also the other fintech companies failing. For example, balance sheet lenders, uh, some payment companies, robo-advisors, social trading companies, uh, many of these companies go out to crowdfunding. Okay, oh, overestimated ability to build a sound portfolio. You see, they are not only convinced that they have the magic formula, they are also convinced that their current stock portfolio, their, their, their non-dynamic existing portfolio as a fact, is, is, is an amazingly good portfolio. However, we have, we, we have to doubt it because uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there is an adverse selection process. Obviously, banks uh, do fund those projects that they find extremely good and very low risk. Banks are not stupid. You see, if I see a client who is very low risk, I, I will extend his or her credit line. If I see a project which is great, I will just competitively try to fund it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very simple math. Uh, so, 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 so these portfolios have to have some sort of adverse uh, selection uh, uh, behind them. And also, uh, 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 we talked about the fact that banks are 3,000 times larger than peer-to-peer -peer lenders and crowdfunders. Maybe peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding is growing <laughs> exponentially and banks uh, basically stagnate, uh, uh, but, but, but still it's a huge difference. And how do you diversify your portfolio? Once I, once I did the math and, and I thought about different uh, vectors, different aspects, different areas of diversification, and it turned out that the minimum portfolio size you have to have for any sort of statistically meaningful diversification is around 200 million US dollars, for example, for a crowdfunding uh, portfolio. Uh, uh, people don't have that portfolio, so they essentially cannot diversify. Diversification is not like I put my money into three companies. That's like three random projects or companies. 
uh, banks do have professionally diversified portfolios. Not perfect, imperfect, but still they do it on an uh, uh, economy of scale, uh, uh, scale and they do it professionally and consciously. Okay, and lastly, N, not known, not direct, other further risks associated with peer-to-peer -peer lending and crowdfunding and this N, this not known, this other, this can be distributed into two groups. One is the unknown that we do know that is unknown, we can imagine, we just don't know about it. And the other is what we don't know we don't know. So we cannot even think about the category, okay? And uh, basically, uh, one of these things which people usually don't think about is this. Um, um, in 2008, the total uh, uh, outstanding amount of uh, mortgages was quite large, but not as large in the United States, for example, as people usually think. Not very large compared to the uh, total global GDP of 75 trillion US dollars, uh, total global nominal GDP uh, annual. Uh, uh, um, um, uh, still, it, it, it brought the global economy down. And the reason for this is very simple. If there is an asset class which is infected, which people, have bad op people and investors have very bad opinion about, and you don't know, and you don't know how much of this asset class an other player has, that is, uh, uh, that is something, that is a risk, which can bring the system down. Like, let's say that these wealth management companies now are trying to issue more and more and more uh, 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 securities based on crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending to their private banking clients, okay? Maybe in three years, they will they will have issued, uh, let's say, 70 billion altogether, because in three years, total volume of crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending may grow to, I don't know, 200 billion US dollars, and out of that, 70 billion will be securitized. But if you don't know how much of that 70 billion your neighbor, the other regional bank, with a total balance sheet of 30 billion US dollars, is holding, then, it's a risk, and you won't want to do business with that, okay? Uh, think it through. This is a very typical type of problem that people don't think about, that when trouble hits, it's a very important thing to know how much of the bad asset uh, the other player is holding. Okay, these are the 12 risks together, like high risks red, uh, medium risk yellow, lower risk uh, uh, green, and... Um, Let's listen to uh, Lord Turner. Peer-to-peer -peer crash will make bankers look like lending geniuses. Okay? He's a regulator uh, from the UK, and uh, this is his opinion. Uh, my opinion is a little bit more moderate. And uh, I have another presentation. Um, do we want to look? Lo can, can I take three more minutes? Yeah? Okay. So... <coughs> This is a research which we conducted uh, quite recently uh, on the 20th of April was the day when we uh, got the data in. We asked 180 compliance experts globally about fintech risks, fintech regulation, banking risks, banking regulation and other things like this. Um, uh, 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 the 180 experts were from 40 different countries. Okay, first thing we identified that regulatory arbitrage, you see it in the middle, consists of two things, regulatory vacuum and regulatory gap. Regulatory vacuum is the amount of regulation that is missing from fintech. Okay, fintech is under-regulated, non-regulated, not clear, da -da 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 -da. Regulatory gap, however, is the over-regulation of banks. It's not my opinion, it's the opinion of 180 experts and it's quantified. You can see it quantified better here, okay? Uh, they, uh, experts rated banks to be uh, regulated up to 63 index points, where 50 index points is the regulatory equilibrium. That is the regulation, that is the level of 
well regulation according to these experts uh, for banks but they think they are regulated to 63 while the well regulation level for fintechs is also 50 and compared to that experts think that uh, fintechs are underestimated only 34 index points okay and the uh, uh, so these are the gaps uh, by the way it's very exciting that bankers uh, think that uh, bankers gave 63 index points for banks, so overregulated, while fintech experts gave the same 63 for banks. Their opinion only differs in how much underregulated fintechs are. Of course, bankers think that fintechs are desperately, terribly underregulated, while fintech experts only think that fintechs are somewhat underregulated. 25 versus 40, 42. Uh, and of course, there are regional differences. There is Korea, blah, 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 Asia, uh, one group, okay? And now we go to this. We ask people from 40 countries, 180 experts, how do you think local online media, online media in your country, represents fintech related risks? What is the narrative? Does Online media, fintech, online fintech media, in your country, overestimate fintech risks or does it underestimate fintech risks? Now, it's a little bit hard to read this, but I will help you. Anything over the red line is local online media underestimating fintech risks, okay? So any number uh, over the red line means underestimation. And by the way, the level of underestimating fintech-related risks, every region answered that in my country, fintech risks are underestimated by online media. <laughs> Essentially, there is a hype. Uh, 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 so, 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 Asia uh, gave the, uh, the, the most scores for underestimation. Uh, U U UK uh, seems to get it a little bit more realistically. So anyway, I could talk much more about this survey. What I wanted to show you is that it's quantified. There is a hype. The hype is not infinite. I love crowdfunding. I love peer-to-peer -peer lending. I just want all of us to be aware of the risks because we want to come to the 10th World FinTech Forum. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Giori, we have a first question uh, from someone named Mr. No Te Hun. He says, thanks for sharing. People you agree with all the risks you mentioned. Can you give an example of a company that has successfully overcome those risks uh, that you mentioned? If not, how, you, how are you envisioning the future of marketplace lending? Mm. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, um, globally, there are approximately 2,000 crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending sites altogether. Out of these 2,000, I would call 200 significantly active. And out of those 200, I would call 20 as well known. And most of this, uh, and by the way, I have heard many, many, many examples of companies which stopped operating. Now, I cannot give, uh, I cannot give exact numbers like, okay, thousand exists but how many did uh, stop operation but my guess would be that so far uh, uh, f total failure rate was 50 percent so probably there were 4,000 companies trying my estimate is that when we get into a significant rate hike cycle when when, when the first real outcry will come from average people you know, they got very angry. They got very angry when projects failed. And they were surprised that they, they are not getting their money back. And the company which promised to build a great drone out of their funding just disappeared. Like the drone took the money away, okay? Uh, 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 so basically, uh, uh, when, when, when the real problems come, when it turns out that NPR rate is not 2%, but 22 
<laughs> and uh, stuff like this. Uh, uh, then I think maybe uh, uh, there will be mergers among them, maybe there will be acquisitions among them, maybe there will be strategic partnerships among them, maybe there will be joint ventures across countries among them, and most of them will end up with their little portfolio as part of a bank. Basically, you know, uh, uh, banks can buy those portfolios if the price is right. And banks will be liquid and solvent because they have to hold enormous capital. They are over-regulated anyway. So basically, my prediction is that the, the number of sites will grow uh, 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 for, 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 for another year. And my prediction is that US rate hikes uh, cycle uh, will happen. I am alone in the world. But I do see rates going back to normal. I don't believe in new normal. And, 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 and uh, I think that uh, uh, when the 10th World FinTech Forum comes, uh, we will probably see uh, uh, around 100 major sites uh, globally, but those 100 will be smart, capable, and, and uh, 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 sizable players uh, with the right uh, uh, amount of, right size of uh, portfolio, and, and that's it. Yeah. Great. We have one more question from the floor. Can we have the mic, please? David, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I just wanted to ask you a question about that survey that you had, uh, if it's possible to put it back. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, um, the survey result that you collected shows that uh, the highest hype uh, wait, has, wait, wait, just a second. No, These the, are two of my favorite projects. On the left, uh, well, the, on, on the left, the tapping machine. It can tap 1,000 pints per hour. Even I can't drink 1,000 pints per hour. And it's a crowdfunding project. Anyway, go on. Okay. Yeah, we will look at this. <laughs> so Asia uh, uh, is overhyped more than, uh, than any other region. Mm -hmm. Um, did you take this survey before the series of scandals in China about the peer -to -p, uh, P, uh, P2P uh, lending sites, or was it after that? I mean, how is this, uh, is this uh, uh, was it like a year ago, or when did you take this? Uh, because I think what's happening in China right now is actually confirming this overhype and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, the failure of those Very P2P important sites. what you say. The bulk of the data, most of the answers out of the 180, uh, uh, we received on the 20th of April 2016. So many, many uh, fraudulent or negatively ending or basically bankrupt cases uh, and peer-to-peer -peer lending problems have already been revealed. But people, history shows that average people, for some reason, are always searching for the magic formula. Like, like, you know, additional return without additional risk. And basically, the, the, you know, it's just somehow impossible to... So explain. it doesn't matter what you're saying, how many scandals were out there, people will still believe uh, in some magic, uh, uh, magic exactly. returns. Exactly, because you know what? Uh, uh, the scandal shouldn't be that these attempts fail the scandal should be that there is a scandal when these attempts fail. You see? You made the analogy of a securitization of P2P lending to the 2008 securitization of the mortgage loan. But I think there are fundamental differences because in a mortgage loan, all assets were based on the real estate risk. But in the case of P2P lending, it's much more diverse than the pure real estate. So the, the securitization of uh, P2P lending, in some sense, is uh, more safer than the, the 2008 of securitization of the mortgage loan. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Yes and no. Yes, because it's true. In this sense, it's better diversified. No, because if, if we go back in time, if we go back in time, we go back 10 years, and you stand up and you give this argument, they would have said, this guy is crazy. He thinks that real estate is not the safest investment. Oh, oh, oh. 
okay, I, 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 I'm just saying that there is always a way to somehow misinterpret risks, at least, uh, uh, let's talk about myself. Sometimes I do misinterpret risks and don't see certain risks. So I just think, of, I just extend my own thinking and I talk about the category which we don't know, we don't know. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, one thing I want to, to say is, okay, we are uh, and probably underestimating risk, but do you think people really uh, know better the product that they are uh, contracting, or with the, the fintech or not? Or they know m most, uh, they know better what they are the, the, they are contracting, because as they are the platform really makes you more detailed. Probably they are uh, probably an underestimating risk, but they are really knowing better what they are doing. Or not? What do you think? Mm. Can you recap the mm. entire question yeah, yeah. summary? So the question was: If people, average people who do uh, crowdfunding, who put their money into crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending, are they aware of the risks? And my answer would be that some of them, yes, but most of them, or many of them, are not. And think about this: Even if the site, even if the site. Uh, is doing a great job telling the risks. Uh, people somehow like to dismiss those risks. Think about smoking, for example, or, or, or think about many other activities. By the way, all mortgage contracts, almost all, almost all mortgage contracts, uh, uh, did list risks. People just thought those risks are not relevant because and here comes the tales, like real estate prices nominally never go down. Historic volatility of real estate prices, every textbook, every good textbook would tell you, is equal to stocks. That's the financial fact. But people for many, many years had this misconception in their heads that real estate prices never nominally go down. What can you do with this? I just wanted to add that I agree with you about the scandal, which is a scandal, because when the super crisis started, a lot of people said it's unbelievable because we thought that those portfolios were diversified because we had mortgages subprime from California and from Ohio. And somebody said, well, but the risk is the same because it's real estate. Wrong. Real estate is an asset class, and the world has learned, at least the financial professionals, that you don't diversify asset classes but to diversify risks. So when the US economy went down, all of these guys went down because they were stretched in their mortgages. Now, the P2P is exactly the same thing. It's not that you're more diversified because you have many more little names. All of those names are linked to the same underlying risk factors that will correlate to one the moment the Chinese economy goes into real trouble. And therefore, you will see massive defaults happening. Having 1,000 names or 1 million names with their low link to the same risk factor doesn't give you any help. Thank you. Yes, and one more thought related to this. Uh, I, w I personally uh, uh, would, uh, would uh, uh, skip uh, mentioning one or two uh, specific uh, pain points, even though I tend to agree with you even in the specifics. Can you recap his question, please? Uh, uh, it, it wasn't a question. He just said that uh, basically um, uh, uh, the situation is somewhat a little bit in certain aspects parallel to the 2008 uh, situation. That was his point. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 so, so here is this. For, 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 for decades, the uh, consensus between economists was that markets uh, are heading towards an equilibrium. What is a market doing? What is the normal state of a market? Equilibrium. Then, uh, when markets never stopped moving, <laughs> we never ever in history for 5,000 years reached any equilibrium on any market, 
then economists switched to this multiple equilibrium theory. I am sure you can remember this. It was very popular 10 years ago and 15 years ago. That yes, 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 prices move because there are multiple equilibriums and we are heading from one equilibrium to the other. Okay? Then it turned out that we are not heading from one equilibrium to the other. We are heading from total mass to the other total mass. Okay? So now the theory is that there is no equilibrium. The normal state of market is the lack of equilibrium. You see? That is the current big theory. I, I don't know what the next one is because if I knew it, you know, I would trade it. But, 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 but this is the current best theory. There is no equilibrium. Well, time limited. Thank you very much for the enthused and stimulating presentation. Thank you very much. It was David Theory, CEO of Banking Reports.